are going to suck the blood out of me. Tons of toes. Chasing each other. That little guy. It's a great tree frog in the water out there, too. Getting some great shots. A lot of bugs are coming through the light. And there's a mosquito. I'm gonna turn the lights off so the bugs don't get us. I'm getting eaten alive. Hi, I'm Brian Kleiman. I've been out here exploring Connecticut swamps, marshes, and forests for as long as I can remember. Ever since I was a kid, I've been out here looking for reptiles and amphibians. I like coming to these places because the world you find here, a world populated by wild things, amazes me. The greatest threat to our wildlife today is development. Our increasing use of land for industry, roads, and housing is reducing habitat for plants and animals, and chopping wild areas up into fragments. Amphibians are vital links between forest and wetland ecosystems. As they move between land and water, frogs and salamanders ferry nutrients between these two habitats. For us, they serve as environmental indicators. The health of the amphibian populations tells us about the health of the places we also inhabit and rely upon for our well-being. I like to see us coexist. For the past two years, I've taken this camera with me to capture things about amphibians that I love, and I think you'll find fascinating as well. Of course, there is no better way to appreciate wildlife than to go out and explore ponds and forests yourself. When you do, consider the impacts you have on natural environments and keep them to a minimum. Now, come with me and explore the world of Connecticut amphibians. You find amphibians all over. Every time you spot one, you have a chance of seeing something you might not have seen before or to learn something you didn't know. Each species has its own place in an ecosystem or a combination of ecosystems. Some salamanders spend most of their time on land, others in brooks and streams. A few go back and forth between land and water during their lives. There are salamanders that breed in the spring and salamanders that breed in the fall. Some have lungs to breathe. Others breathe through their skin or a lining of their mouth. Most rely on two or more ways of breathing. A couple of species of salamanders interbreed to produce hybrid offspring. Most go through a couple of phases or a metamorphosis before reaching maturity. Another hatches as a small adult and changes little except to grow bigger. Our native frogs also have many unique and different adaptations for surviving in local habitats. Some breed so early in the spring that the ponds still have ice on them. Others wait till the dog days of summer. Most frogs call or sing during their breeding season and you can recognize them by their calls. Some come to temporary ponds, such as vernal pools, to breed. Other frogs need more permanent bodies of water. There are frogs that live much of their lives in the litter on the forest floor, a few that climb trees, and toads that prefer sandy dry places. All have ways of surviving winter, and it's when things start to thaw that our story of local amphibians begins. You wouldn't know it looking at the blanket of snow over this frozen wetland, but spring is on its way. When the snow melts and the spring rains come, this place will fill with water. Trees and shrubs will leaf out and turn it the shades of green for which wetlands like this one, our vernal pools, are named. To native amphibians, snow melt and rain are signs that their annual cycle of life is about to start again. I'm standing on some ice still on the vernal pools. 
It is not very thick. And just because there's ice on this pool doesn't mean there's no activity. As long as the wood frogs and the spotted salamanders can access the water, like over there, they will come in here to lay their eggs, even underneath the ice. Amphibians' annual trek from winter habitat to spring breeding pools is a natural wonder. The drive to reproduce is strong and draws amphibians out of their burrows and into the pools in large numbers. Here we are on a nice rainy night looking for salamander migration. We're going to backtrack and see if we can find them. Crossing the road going down to the marsh there he is. Here's a nice look at a spotted salamander. Crossing the road on a 40 degree night. It's wet and rainy. Appears to be a female. Just from her girth, you can tell that she's got a bunch of eggs in her. Going down to the vernal pools to uh, deposit them. So we'll help her on her way since we happen to be here in the road. So very gently. I'm gonna pick her up. I've already wet my hands on the road. It's always good if you're picking up a salamander, make sure your hands are wet. Because the salts in our hands will actually dry out their skin. I'm gonna put her over here in the leaves. And let her be on her way. And we've got more salamanders to find. Just to give you an idea how big these guys get, we grabbed this huge spotted salamander off the road. It's probably about a good seven inches long. Largest terrestrial salamander you can find here in Connecticut. Besides the mud puppy, who's aquatic, gets about two feet long. We won't be finding any of those tonight. So let's help this one out and bring our crust. These lights probably aren't helping her. So we'll leave her be. Well, on our way back to our car, there's some more salamanders coming across the road. Here is a nice look at another cool salamander. This is uh, actually a hybrid salamander, part blue spotted, part Jefferson. In some populations they look more like Jeffersons, and in some populations they look more like blue spotted. This appears to look more like a Jefferson. It's more brown. It's large. Let me see. It's my finger. It's my hand. It's a good sized salamander. Another probable female. You can see how girthy she is. Now what's interesting about these is when you pick them up, they secrete a slime all over your hand. It's one of their defenses. It tastes very bad. I wouldn't know. I've never tried one. But other animals do not like to eat them. All right, we're doing good. Let's keep going. Well, every day you make new discoveries. Well, maybe not every day, but sometimes every salamander hunt you've located over here. Four-toed salamander who's wiggling her tail, trying to distract us from the important part of the body. I have been coming here for many years. I've never, ever found a four-toed salamander here. So maybe I've just overlooked them, or maybe it's a new population that we have never known about, which is very cool. Fairly small salamander, not easy to pick up. Also see that bottom of the salamander. White bellies with peppered with black speckles. Small salamander, about three inches long. We're gonna move to the side of the road here. Ugh. We'll let her be. 
All right. Now we're in Jefferson salamander habitat. Here is a good candidate. Nice big Jefferson salamander. They are quite different than the other ones. They're not as dark. They're more brown on their back, and they have more, you know, sparse freckling on the sides. Sometimes it's real hard to tell. She's making her way over to the vernal pools. And we are getting really wet. And we'll let her go. Both sides of the road here. You can hear all the peepers peeping. And we've come across a lot of peepers moving across the road. A lot of squished spring peepers, as you can see. It was a busy road earlier. But luckily, there's still many peepers moving across. There's a nice big female. You can always tell the females are fat with eggs. Another peeper moving. And he's a hopping peeper. I can gently get him on my hand. It's not easy to do because these guys are so small. Usually if you can get them on your hand, they'll leap off just like that. <laughs> Yay, we got our peeper. You see he's got a nice X on his back. The species name is Crucifer for the crossed X on his back. And there he goes and we'll let him be on his way. We well, don't always see these crossing the roads with all the salamanders. It's a big old female green frog who's just probably woken up in the past day or two. Probably snacking on some spring peepers in the road. See that she's a female if you look right behind the eye. You see her titanic membrane right there. And it's the exact same size as the eye so we know it's a female. Males have larger membranes. She's probably pretty cold. Not too active here. Just gonna gently slide her up on my hand. She is not active at all. Move her across the side of the road. There's actually a nice pond over here. She's probably heading over towards. And there she is. All right, we saw something back here that looked to be a toad. There he is. American toads out tonight crossing the roads of all the spring peepers, the wood frogs, all the salamanders. It's very cold. It's only about 40 degrees out. But yet these guys are moving. We'll bring them across without getting run over ourselves. Don't go back in the road, bud. If you listen off in the distance, you can hear peepers. You can also hear wood frogs quacking. And here in the road, we've got some wood frogs moving. There's one. There's another one over here. Now, wood frogs and peepers are among the first frogs to wake up. They breed fairly quick. These guys are actually going away from the marsh. So they have probably all done breeding. So once they're done with their vernal pools, they go off into the woods. They live in the leaf litter. And as soon as I put them in here, I've lost them. I zoom out and shake the camera up. Go ahead and find them again. This looks like a brown leaf. It's so camouflaged. It's very really hard to find the camera. There he is. My batteries are dying in my lamp. I could hear the wood frogs in this pool from way down the trail, but was amazed to find hundreds of them in a breeding frenzy. Wood frogs are among the first to wake up from hibernation. 
They can survive partial freezing in winter, thanks to a natural antifreeze in their blood, so they get to the pools early. They're explosive breeders that can finish laying eggs in just a few days. Males quack to attract females. When a female approaches, males will grab them in an embrace called amplexus. Paired up, the male is in a position to fertilize a female's eggs as she deposits them. Days later, all is quiet. After laying their eggs in large communal masses, the wood frogs are gone. Depending on water temperature and sunlight, tadpoles will hatch within weeks. When you wade into a vernal pool at night in early spring, as I do, you can find yourself surrounded by the calls of spring peepers. Like wood frogs, peepers also tolerate partial freezing and emerge early. In a given pool, hundreds of frogs may join in a chorus that gets so loud it can be heard hundreds of feet away. Peepers' ears are adapted to the noise. Males are practically deaf to it, while females can pick out calls that are music to their ears. Once paired, peepers swim down to where females deposit single eggs. Tadpoles may hatch as soon as a week later. Two more frogs that are early spring breeders are the pickerel frog and the northern leopard frog. Like wood frogs and peepers, pickerel frogs are common throughout Connecticut. Their raspy washboard calls are distinctive, but can be hard to hear over our spring peepers choruses. If you listen carefully and try to ignore the peepers, you can hear a leopard frog calling in the background. Now it's a couple of weeks later, and this place is just filled with thousands upon thousands of wood frog tadpoles that have hatched out of their eggs, and they're feeding here on the algae, and this place is just filled with them. There's movement everywhere, especially on this algae over here. There's just thousands and thousands of wood frog tadpoles eating as quick as they can because this vernal pool is not going to last too much longer. It's already half the size as it was earlier. Getting stranded isn't the only danger tadpoles face. Once things warm up, predators like this bullfrog may stop in and eat their fill of them. Another common sight in breeding pools around this time are these milky colored egg masses. These are spotted salamander eggs. You can see that while the spotted salamander larvae are still developing, peeper tadpoles have hatched and are swimming around the eggs to graze on the algae covering them. Take a closer look and you can see in the lower right hand corner of the picture, individual larvae inside the eggs. The dark shapes are developing larvae, the white are the dead larvae in the eggs that failed. It won't be long before this spotted salamander larva wriggles out of its egg to begin the next phase of its life. Not all the eggs amphibians lay succeed. Some fail to develop. Others are preyed upon by predators who see eggs as easy pickings in the vernal pool food chain. Among the potential predators are caddisfly nymphs in the family Limnophilidae. These are aquatic insect larvae that build protective cases that they live in until transforming into adults. Most feed on algae, but at least one species in Connecticut preys heavily on amphibian egg masses. I came across these toads during the day after hearing one call from a puddle in the farm road. I went back that night to tape them when they would be much easier to approach. Standing in the dark, I found myself with toads singing all around me. 
the high-pitched trills of American toads are unmistakable. And when they're two feet in front of you, they're deafening. If you listen, you can also hear release calls. Release calls are the sound of one male chirping at another to say, You've grabbed another male. Let go. Great tree frogs also have a very distinctive call. Driving past a pond in northwestern Connecticut one night, I heard what sounded like a huge number of them. There were frogs everywhere. There were frogs in the trees, down in the brush, everywhere I went. There may have been hundreds or thousands of frogs, all singing as loud as they could. If they are concerned about me being there, they didn't show it. The drive to breathe is strong, and they kept calling like I wasn't even there. It was very cold the morning I found this red spot in Newt. Looking into the water, I saw Newt swim past and followed him with my camera. He led me to where I found a pair in an plexus. Male Newts grasp females with their hind legs and perform a ritual with their tails to fan chemicals they produce her way. These pheromones stimulate the female during the fertilization process. Female Newts deposit eggs singly at the rate of half a dozen or more a day until they have scattered a few hundred eggs around the pond. I got an unexpected surprise when I found another newt struggling to pluck a parasite off its forelimb and tail. Scientists are concerned that man's use of fertilizers on land is increasing the growth of aquatic plants in newt habitats. They support increasingly larger populations of leeches. The result is a sort of double whammy for newts where the leeches are not only spreading disease, but also interrupting the normal breeding of infected newts. Hank Gruner is one of a group of scientists studying how human uses of Connecticut's land resources are affecting native amphibians such as newts. Um, well, I've been doing amphibian and reptile research for about, uh, oh, 25 years now, I guess it is going on. Time flies when you're having fun, I guess. Um, we're here out in what we call the Zor Block, which is part of the Connecticut Amphibian Monitoring Project. And we're in our, this is our ninth field season. And what we're doing is we're looking, we're collecting biological data on the amphibian communities that breed within the wetlands. We're also looking at land use land cover changes over a 15 year period of time using uh, geographic information system software and satellite data collected uh, by the University of Connecticut and the DEP. Uh, and what we're out really spe specifically doing today is we realized that as we were analyzing the biological data about amphibians, we were starting to see some trends. And to get a better handle on what was happening with those trends, we wanted to determine um, what the characteristic of the wetlands were. And we're testing that out today uh, here in Monroe so we can see uh, when we look at our biological data, is it the wetlands differences that's causing the changes or is it really uh, more likely the uh, land use land cover? It's been several weeks since I first visited the pool filled with wood frog tadpoles. As soon as they hatch, tadpoles begin feeding on the remains of their eggs. They're hungry to grow quickly and eventually move on to eating algae and picking at the leaf litter for any available nutrients.
A week or two later, you can see how the tadpole's limbs are beginning to appear, with their hind limbs emerging first. By the time their front limbs appear, the tadpoles also start to gulp for air as they begin to exercise developing lungs. Shortly before they leave the water, the new frog's tails are absorbed back into their bodies. Days later, these young frogs, or metamorphs, are ready to move on to land for the first time. I taped this spotted salamander larva as it was about halfway through its metamorphosis. Like tadpoles, many salamanders also hatch as juvenile or larva form, and then go through metamorphosis before becoming adults. But unlike tadpoles, larval phase spotted salamanders and the larva of many other salamanders have external gills. Frog tadpoles' gills are internal. The salamander's external gills are the feather-like structures you can see behind the larva's head. They enable larval salamanders to breathe by extracting oxygen from the water and releasing carbon dioxide back into it. Unlike frogs, salamanders actually retain their tails as they change into adults. Here's a large puddle that's just filled with toad tadpoles. Look at this. In another couple weeks, these guys will all be turning into little toads. You can see they're definitely toad tadpoles. Got big fat bodies with small tails. But I'm not the only one who knows her here. That dark shape right there is a painted turtle. And I guarantee he's in here picking off these toad tadpoles. Pretty easy prey. waiting for me to leave, so go about his business. Late spring is the time the big frogs start to call. Around ponds like this one, it's not unusual to hear the plucked banjo call of the green frog along with the bellowing of the bullfrogs. Green frogs are often confused with their cousin the bullfrog. They're both big, heavy frogs, but green frogs are distinguished by the dorsolateral ridge that runs from behind their eye down their backs. Males aren't afraid to throw their weight around to compete for and defend territory as they stake out around the shoreline. When you get too close to them, they'll let out a squawk and dive underwater. Bullfrogs are the kings of the ponds and are opportunistic carnivores. The largest frog in North America, they'll eat anything that moves and that will fit into their mouth. Males are also very territorial and will attack other male frogs and do a lot of splashing to decide disputes. Green frogs and bullfrogs both lay large masses of eggs that float on the surface. Metamorphosis can take two or more seasons. Well, this place has changed a lot since we were first here in early spring when it was filled with wood frogs. If I was here in early spring sitting right where I am, I'd be underneath water and there'd be masses of wood frogs around me calling and quacking and breeding. Now it's summer and there's no more water. The vernal pool has dried up. The wood frogs, peepers, and spotted salamanders have moved to the nearby woods and meadows. Their eggs hatched, and those that grew into metamorphs before the pool dried out are gone now too. As soon as they're done breeding, wood frogs return to the woods where they live in the leaf litter, foraging on invertebrates. If there's a dry spell, they hunker down in the soil and wait for rain to return some moisture to the forest. Their coloration helps them blend in, but they still have to watch out for the garter snakes and ribbon snakes that prey on them. You often find peepers moving around the forests in the summer as well. Not much is known about the time peepers spend in the forest. 
You find adults like these, and if you're lucky, tiny new metamorphs like this one. Pickerel frogs are similar in appearance to northern leopard frogs, but easily separated by their square spots. They also have bright yellowish-orange warning colors concealed underneath their upper thighs. They're found in a variety of habitats, open areas of woodlands, and around shallow bodies of water. Northern leopard frogs require open grassy habitats, especially floodplains along rivers and streams. They're distinguished by their uneven round spots. Both pickerel and leopard frogs evade predators by zigzagging through the grass, almost like a rabbit. Here's a little guy that I just found. He moved and I was able to recognize him as a little red eft, which is a terrestrial stage of the red spotted newt. He just came out of the water this year. You can tell by the size of him, he's only about a little over an inch long. He's going to remain on land for a couple years, and then he eventually he'll start turning greener and transform into a, an adult red spotted newt, go back into the water where he'll live out the rest of his life. We'll let him be on his way. And a little bit further down the path, we have a larger red eft. This guy has already been on land for a couple years. He'll probably go back into the water, if not this fall, next year sometime. You see he's got bright orange coloration. This is because F's do not taste good. And they're telling their predators not even to mess with me because I will definitely not be appetizing. F's may remain on land for as long as two to five years. During this terrestrial stage, F's can move across the landscape to colonize other wetlands and extend the range of the newt populations. Here in my right hand is a red eft, as which we saw before. And remember they start turning green to turn into adults. Here is what they start looking like before they go back into the water. He still is retaining those red spots. If you look closely at this guy, his tail is starting to flatten. That's going to help him get around easier in the water. But a great look at the same species in different phases. The ways that gray tree frogs have adapted to living in trees are truly amazing. Their coloration matches local trees so well that you rarely see frogs like this one unless they move and you're looking right at them. The only time that they show any color is when climbing and then it's intentional. The orange on their inner thighs is a warning to predators. These bright markings warn predators that gray tree frogs aren't very tasty. On their fingers are suction cup like sticky toe pads. They use these to cling to tree trunks, branches, and leaves. On humid or rainy nights, you may find gray tree frogs on windows, usually where there's a light to attract bugs. The toe pads are actually made of fine hair like structures that are too small to see but cling to all sorts of surfaces. You also get a great look at the orangish yellow color on the inner thigh that serves as our warning color. Alright, well we just lifted up this log. We have found a nice fat marbled salamander. Marbled salamanders belong to the abyssidomatid family, or the mole salamanders, along with the Jefferson's blue spotted and spotted salamander. Mole salamanders are fossorial, which means they're adapted to living under leaves and logs on the forest floor or in burrows beneath. Marbled populations are scattered around Connecticut, except in high elevations, but they're not often seen because of their subterranean habits. Marbled salamanders use vernal pools differently from other ambistomatids. They migrate to the dried up pools in late summer and lay their eggs near the bottom. This strategy enables the marbles to take advantage of the resource at a time when they don't have to compete with the other developing amphibians. It also benefits the young marbles. 
They hatch and develop through fall and winter, and by the spring, they're ready to feed on the invertebrates that become abundant in early spring and the developing larvae of other amphibians as well. So we'll put her back very carefully. And there she goes. Instead of moving this log over her, we're just going to push in some of those leaves there, cover it up so that no predators will be able to easily find her. The blue spotted salamander is another ambistomatid or mole salamander and it commonly interbreeds with the Jefferson salamander to produce a variety of hybrid offspring. Now true blue spotted salamanders like this one are distinguished from the hybrids by their smaller size very very black and also they have larger blue spots as compared to the hybrids which are not true black and have a lot of small tiny freckles of the blue. Now unlike Jefferson's which are found west of the Connecticut River populations of blue spotted salamanders are scattered in areas of eastern Connecticut as well. Here they're restricted to places along the Connecticut River Valley and the southeastern corner of the state. And while Jefferson's salamanders are rarely seen except during the early spring breeding season Blue spotted salamanders may be found under cover throughout the summer and fall. It's rare to see an adult spotted salamander once breeding season is over. They spend most of their time beneath cover, like logs or beneath the surface in burrows. The ones that you do see later in summer are the metamorphs. The young spotted's in their first season as adults that are moving to the woodland areas. American toads also move to the woodlands in the summer. In forest habitats like the trap rock ridges of central Connecticut, they may share resources with potential predators such as snakes. Look behind the toad's eye and you can see his parotid gland. This gland produces bufotoxins, chemicals that are a toad's best defense. When threatened, toads secrete their toxins, some of which are strong enough to sicken would-be predators. Fowler's toads are very similar to American toads, and the two species interbreed and hybridize. You can tell the two apart by looking at the black spots near their parotid glands. Fowler's toads have many little red bumps in these black spots. American toads just have three or four. Unfortunately for toads, bufotoxins aren't always enough to deter predators. The chemicals seem to have little effect on the garter snake I found that caught and ate this toad. The toad tried a second line of defense, which was to puff itself up, inflate itself so it would be harder to swallow. But as you can see, the snake was intent on eating it no matter what. The small red spot on the toad's back is actually part of its lung. You can see where the snake's teeth punctured the toad's skin and how its lung popped out when the toad puffed up. The toad battled for over an hour, but in the end, the snake won. Garter snakes are among toad's top predators. Most animals avoid toad's bufotoxins, but garter snakes, ribbon snakes, and eastern hognose snakes don't seem to mind. Eastern spadefoot toads are endangered in Connecticut and are quite rare. They prefer areas of loose or sandy soil where they can burrow deep into the ground, which makes them even harder to find. Unfortunately, populations of spadefoot toads have been wiped out and continue to be lost because we don't know that they're there. They're named for this hardened curved protrusion or spade on its hind feet. They'll actually dig backwards using their spades to bury themselves in the sand the way this one is. To disappear before our eyes.
adaptation Spadefoot Toads have developed for digging, meant to give them an advantage, now puts them at a greater risk. There are places in Connecticut where populations of as many as 800 to 1,000 Spadefoot Toads existed, but have since disappeared. It's possible that we're still building in places that may be home to one of the few remaining Spadefoot populations in the state. The northern two-line salamander is one of three species of plethodontids often found together in and around streams. They lay their eggs in streams attached to the undersides of rocks from late spring to early summer. The larvae hatch weeks later and take two to three years to develop into adults. Excellent. We have found one, a northern dusky salamander. Here's a good look at a northern dusky salamander. You can tell it's a dusky by its shovel-like head, with its very stiff lower jaw, and because they're equipped with these very powerful hind legs. These adaptations help them push their way through their habitat, over stream banks, or wedging their way underneath rocks and debris at the bottom of a stream. Duskies lay their eggs in late summer, it's not far from the water. Females wrap their bodies around the eggs to brood them. Larval dusky salamanders hatch out in the fall and enter the water. They stay in the water through the winter and into the spring before developing into adults. There we are. Look at the size of this guy. Beautiful adult spring salamander. He's at least six inches long, if not a tad bit longer. And this is a species rarely seen in Connecticut because they prefer these cold mountain streams. They're very susceptible to pollution. This guy is very cooperative, which is much appreciated. Beautiful spring salamander. They used to call this salamander the purple salamander for an obvious reason. Once he goes in that water, he has a lovely purple color. While I was out here looking for adult spring salamanders, I had the good fortune to also find a larval spring salamander. You can get a good look here at the external gills that larval spring salamanders have that enable them to breathe underwater. It takes two years for spring salamanders to go through their metamorphosis. This one's pretty big, so it may be getting close to the time when it will turn into in an adult. In the meantime, as you can see, it is very well adapted to making its way along the bottoms of clean, cold, fast-moving streams that spring salamanders prefer. It's fitting that we come to the redback salamander last. Redbacks are the most common vertebrate in the woods. A New Hampshire study found salamanders were a huge percentage of vertebrate biomass in the forests there, twice that of birds and equal to mice and shrews. Of salamander biomass, 94% was redbacks, making them a key component of northeast forest ecosystems. They live a different life from most other salamanders, reproducing on land. Redbacks lay their eggs on moist soil. Larvae develop within the egg and hatch as many adults. The only other local salamander to do this is a northern slimy salamander, which is rare in Connecticut and more common west of the Hudson River. Right. Yep. You find redback salamanders in three colorations. The redback phase, the leadback phase, which is all gray, 
and the coral phase, which is all red and the rarest. Well, we've explored a lot about amphibians and seen Connecticut from their point of view. What I wonder is, what sort of an environment will they find next year? Will the vernal pools or lakes or forests they need to survive still be habitable when they wake up in the spring? Will they feel additional impacts from human activities such as development or the application of fertilizers? It's up to us. If you ask me, we have a lot to learn. We need to learn how to get the things we need in life while leaving room for amphibians. We'll all be better off. If you see me out there, come say hi.